well, thank you very much for coming. So it's going to be a four lectures uh, class on a safe avoiding walk. And maybe before I, uh, I really dive in, uh, in the subject, I would first like to tell you a little bit how it's going to be organized. So in, in the first lecture, so today, it's mostly going to be generalities. So there are like a few things we really need uh, to discuss before we, uh, we really start. So in particular, one thing is going to be where the definitions of the objects we will look at. And uh, then from these definitions, there will be very, very quickly a quantity that we will need to, to study a little bit more in detail, which is called the connective constant. So that's going to take us a little bit of time. Once we have defined this connective constant, there is a very classical argument. And uh, we are going to, I mean, it's going to pop up several times in the lecture. We are going to improve it in the second and maybe in the third lecture. So it's called the Hammersley-Welsh argument. It's a very cute one. And I hope I will convince you of that. So we will spend time to uh, discuss it. And then we will finish with discussing a little bit infinite self-avoiding walks. Can we define the measure on infinite self-avoiding walk? How does it look? And so on. So that's the first uh, lecture. The second lecture, which will be uh, next Tuesday, this will focus, and some people already saw uh, talk of me on this, this will focus on self-avoiding walk on the hexagonal lattice. on a very specific lattice for which we know much more. And on this lattice, the first thing we will do is we will prove, I mean, compute the connective constant. And we will prove that this connective constant is equal to square root of 2 plus square root of 2. That's the thing that probably several of you already saw. But that is going to be just the beginning, actually, of, uh, of this, this second lecture. It will be very short. So what I will do after that is I would improve Hammersley Welsh. And that's the first improvement in 50 years. So you are going to see this Hammersley Welsh is very elementary argument. But it took very long to actually be able to improve it by even a little bit. Then I'm going to give you a little bit of work in the sense that I'm going to describe to you an argument which I like very much. And this argument is basically explaining how you can really improve drastically Hammersley Welsh and basically get a result which would be extremely good for us, but conjectured, I mean, uh, conditioned on the conjecture. So a conjecture leading to what we call polynomial bounds. And this, you, it will make much more sense once I will have, uh, once I will have uh, told you what, what is uh, Hammersley Welsh and uh, what we do with it. I will also discuss conformal invariance, but uh, this will really only be a discussion. There is no mathematical theorem. And, uh, yeah. and the relation to Ninhaus computation. So all this second lecture will be devoted to this, uh, to this uh, special word among uh, self-forwarding work, which is a word of self-forwarding work on the, on the hexagonal lattice. Then lecture three, which will be next, I mean, I mean, it will be on Friday, and this is Friday 16. So be careful, there is a slight change of, uh, of plan. It's not going to be every Tuesday. So on Friday, what we will do is we will study the geometry of self-avoiding walk. 
how does they look typically? And there will be two main theorems. The first step will be to study them locally. How do they look locally? So local geometry. And there, the key word is we are going to prove Keston's pattern theorem. And in the second step, we are going to look at the global geometry. And there we will prove that they are sub-ballistic. So sub-ballistic. Last lecture. Which will be on Tuesday. But be careful, Tuesday. 27th, so there will be one, uh, one jump. Uh, there we will study self avoiding walk on ZD with D very, very large. Because we are going to see in this last lecture that self avoiding walk in very high dimension, in fact, so is behaving like random walk. So the self avoiding condition doesn't give you any strong constraints. And so there, what we will do is we will discuss first what we call the bubble condition and its application. And second, and this should scare uh, people who already know the world, but I think we cannot do without it. So we are going to discuss less expansion which is a thing that enables you to prove this bubble condition. So the bubble condition will be a nice uh, condition on self avoiding walk, and you will see that you can deduce a lot of things from it in a very in soft and elegant way. Then proving that this condition holds true in a large dimension is a much more delicate matter, and that will be the subject of this less expansion. OK, so that was just a brief thing for, uh, I mean, that we know where we are going. I mean, well, I know where I'm going. You probably, many of these words don't make any sense for you now, but they will uh, soon. OK, so first lecture is about these generalities. And let me first tell you what is self avoiding work. So, first, self avoiding work. bridges and polygons. By the way, so what I will try to do during the lectures is to give you not so many exercises, but uh, a lot of open questions. And I would be extremely happy if any of you managed to solve any of those. Um, so there would be a bunch of open questions, not so many exercises, simply because they are, I mean, they are usually quite difficult. So. I'm, uh, I'm not sure I want you to lose too much time on that. But if you really want exercises, you can come to see me, and uh, I will uh, find some. Uh, I should have told you maybe uh, one, uh, two things. So if you want manuscripts on safe avoiding work, the main one is due to Madras and Slade. I think that's the most comprehensive one, and it's a very well-written uh, manuscript. So I recommend it uh, warmly. And then if you want something a little bit more recent with a little bit of the recent uh, development, you can look at lecture notes by Roland Bauer Schmidt, Slade again, and myself. OK. So self-avoiding work, bridges, and polygons. So what are they? So first thing, in these lectures, we will always work on a lattice. So G would be a lattice. Meaning an infinite graph, which is transitive, locally finite, and connected. OK? V will be the set of vertices, and E is the set of edges. So these are, are the vertices and the set of edges. And really think, I mean, let's just pick examples because we, we are going to mostly work on them. So think of ZD. OK. 
okay, so uh, in Z2 and uh, higher dimension. Think also of the hexagonal lattice, which I will call H. And you can also think, for instance, because that's one of the only cases where we will manage any way to say anything, think, for instance, of the ladder or of the tree, the DRE tree. I will call it TD, where here the degree is D plus 1. OK, so the binary tree has degree 3. So think of these lattices. And now the object we will look at would be of four types. So there will be what we call a walk. So a walk is just a sequence, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma n in V such that gamma i, gamma i plus 1 is an edge for every e. OK? So it's a sequence of neighboring vertices, simply. Now we say that it's a safe avoiding walk. So, uh, so sequence uh, gamma. It's a finite sequence or an infinite sequence, whatever. So a safe avoiding walk where it's simply a walk such that gamma i equal gamma j implies i equal j. Okay, it's a one-to-one -one walk. You are allowed to go only once to every vertex of your lattice. Okay? And then we will just introduce two other things. So there will be a safe avoiding Polygon, well, this will be just a walk such that gamma 0 equals gamma n. So it goes back to the same vertex. And gamma i equals gamma j implies i equals j or 0 equals n. OK? So a safe avoiding polygon is simply a walk going back to this original point. The only thing that I'm going to add to that is that I'm going to look at these walks, but up to rerouting and reorientation. OK, so here I, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I look at um, equivalence classes up to translation and uh, um, of, uh, of indexes and uh, re reordering, I mean, uh, global, uh, global flip. So I'm, I don't want to say what is the original point gamma 0, and I don't want to say in which direction the polygon is um, is uh, discovered, OK? And last object, it's a safe avoiding bridge in direction E. Actually, maybe let's not. Uh, in direction E. Let's ignore that. Okay. So it's going to be a bridge. It's going to be the following. So it's a walk, but which never goes left of its starting point and never go right of its uh, ending point. So it's going to be gamma self-avoiding walk. such that, well, 
gamma i scalar product with E1 is smaller than gamma i scalar product with E1, smaller or equal to gamma n is E1 for every i in 1n. Okay? So notice just a small subtlety here. I do not allow you to go back exactly to the same height, I mean to the same place as the first starting point, but I do allow you to touch several times the ending one. It's going to be convenient for the de decomposition later. Yes? So now this graph is embedded in the plane. Exactly. So that's what I was going to say. So here, this will make sense only when L is embedded in Rd. And E1 is the first uh, vector of the canonic base. Yes, very good. Okay, so maybe let's give names to the different sets. So the, uh, and to, so the n here is going to be the length of my walk. Notice that there are n plus 1 vertices in a walk of length n. So it's really the number of edges. Okay? So the set of walks of length n, I will call it Wn, the set of self holding walk of length n, SAWn, polygons SAPn, and uh, here SABn. Just here, I don't want these things to be infinite, so when I mean this is the self holding walk of length n starting at 0. So gamma 0 equals 0. Idem here. Here, it's up to translation anyway, so we ignore that. Yeah. Or maybe we say containing 0 something. And here, it's starting at 0 again. OK? OK. So the, the model, this, these objects, were first considered by uh, a mathematician. So I mean, model introduced. by Orr in 47, I think. The poor uh, fellow actually died a few years after introducing it. No connection to self holding work there. But he was not, I mean, uh, didn't get recognized for the introduction of this model. What he did actually is maybe not that interesting anyway. So he counted the self holding work of very small length on Z3 or Z2, I don't remember. So it was really enumerative. You are going to see we are going to do things of the same sort. But that's what he did. Uh, people usually refer to uh, another discovery. So it was rediscovered by Paul Flory, which is a chemist, in 53. It's actually a very famous chemist. He got the Nobel Prize. Um, and here, what he did was already a little bit more interested. What he did is the following. So what you can think of is you have a finite number of self holding walk of length n. So you can define the measure, which is just a uniform measure on this set. Okay, you take the uniform measure, and then you look at, well, the typical distance between the starting point and the ending point. So you look at the expectation. So this is the expectation with respect to this measure of gamma n and for some, well, let's put it like that. So this just that you, you have, I mean, you understand what I mean by that, is just one over the size of your, uh, your uh, graph times the sum of a gamma, uh, si size of your set, sorry, sum of a gamma in your set of gamma n. OK, this is the Euclidean norm. And what Paul Fleury predicted is the following. 
he predicted that this is growing with n. as follows, so prediction that this is growing like n to the new plus little o of 1, where new is equal to 3 fourths in 2D. So if you take, for instance, z2, or let's say, well, it's equal to uh, 0 0.59, something like that. Here it's numerical on Z3. And it's equal to 1 half on Zd with D larger or equal to 4. So uh, the prediction of, uh, of Flory actually doesn't include this numerical uh, value, but it does include this three-fourths and this one-half. So notice, I mean, maybe it's a good point to just make a comparison. If you take the same question, you consider the same question, but for just walks, not safe avoiding walks. So if you look at No, that's not a good idea. If you look at this is the uniform measure on uh, Wn, so that's what people know as a simple random walk, there what you end up is this thing is always behaving like square root n, whatever the dimension. So what Flory predicted is that in dimension four and more, it does behave like the simple random walk, but that in dimension three and in dimension two, it does go much farther. The typical distance between the end point and the original point is much bigger, which is kind of intuitive if you think of the repulsion in the walk, which is going to push the walk further. I will come back to this because you are going to see between the intuition and mathematical theorems, there is really a huge discrepancy there. But indeed, this prediction of Flory is actually quite interesting because it tells you that in dimension three and two, the walk, the self holding walk, seems to be really a different model from the simple random walk. There is uh, really something different. Funnily enough, you are going to see that uh, the prediction of uh, Flory is quite accurate. It does indeed behave like one half here. It does behave like three fourths here. Here it didn't. Pre it predicted actually uh, two thirds maybe. So only in dimension three didn't he predict the right thing. What is kind of surprising is that actually the three fourths is one of these examples of there are not so many numbers between one and zero, or one and one half, because the way he predicted the three fourths is absolutely wrong. He predicted two. He, he said okay two things are happening for the safe avoiding walk, and if you combine these two things, you get three-fourths. The truth is that none of the two things uh, are existing for safe avoiding walk, <laughs> and that, well, the two together give you exactly the right result, but for completely wrong reasons. So, okay, we will see. I will actually give you a heuristic why it's three-fourths uh, during the second lecture, which this one is, I mean, we believe, uh, right. Okay. Um, just before I, I, uh, I go to the second section, let me just make uh, a remark that most of what I'm going to say, basically everything except what I will tell about the safe holding work on the hexagonal lattice, is generalizable. So there is a generalization. So imagine you do the following. So you look at a certain function, let's call it, uh, so for gamma, a random walk, define phi of gamma to be the sum for x in Zd 
uh, x in L, sorry, of, uh, let's call it phi of L x of gamma. Don't worry, I'm going to tell you what these things are. Where L x of gamma is just the number of visits of uh, gamma to x. Okay, so it's the occupation time of my work at x, number of times I visit. And phi, well, it's a function from the integers into r plus, such that two things. I want phi 0 to be equal to 0. I want basically that if the work doesn't visit a vertex, it doesn't contribute to this sum. This sum is not going to take into account anything where the work is not uh, visiting the, the, the vertex. But I also want that f of n plus k is larger or equal to f of n plus f of k. So I want basically that I'm going to think of this as a global penalization for your work. And I want it to be larger if I visit n plus k times than the penalization that I would get for a work visiting n times plus the penalization that you will get for a work uh, uh, visiting k times. This will be what, what we call a self-repulsion for the work. So the more you visit a guy, the worse it is for you. And then, basically, you define Pn uh, phi of gamma to be, well, 1 over constant times exponential of minus phi, I mean, phi of gamma. So the probability of a walk would be larger if you have a smaller phi, okay? So let me give you a few examples of these guys. Well, the first one is phi of k equals 0 for every k. In this case, what you end up with is simply simple random work. So you end up with this guy. There is no penalization. You don't care about the visits. Everybody gets, z I mean, one here. So you exactly get one over the number of possible works. Then the second possibility is f of k equal 0 if k equals 0, and infinity if k is larger or equal to 1. In this case, what does it say? It says this thing is going to be infinite as soon as I have two visits somewhere. So what do I get? I get the safe avoiding group. Yeah? Could then be k larger than 1 uh, rather than larger or equal? Uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. You're entirely right. Sorry. So in this case, you get self avoiding work. Yeah. Sorry about that. You could get f of k to be, for instance, mu times k. But the most, or maybe let me just mention another one. The most common one will be beta over 2 k times k minus 1. And this is called the weekly self-avoiding walk. It kind of interpolates between these two models. Beta equals 0 is a simple random walk. Beta equals infinity is the self-avoiding walk. Okay, so this is the weekly self-avoiding walk, and it's also sometimes referred to as the dome joyce model. Okay, and what I meant here, why uh, did I mention all of this? Because basically, what if you take a model of this sort with a phi satisfying these things, basically everything I'm going to mention works. It actually works in a simpler way than for the strictly self avoiding work. It's kind of the most difficult case. Okay? So all these things were introduced to model polymers. So long chains of uh, molecules or subconsistence. So you can think of plastic or DNA. 
Um, and the goal was, and actually, I mean, at least Flory's goal was to understand how the woke, how the polymer, place himself in a solvent, in a, in a, a liquid. Okay. So that was uh, just an introduction of the objects. Now let's start to do math. So first thing is, I mean, second, yeah, second statement is connective constant. So maybe one of the first questions you can uh, ask yourself before you really dive into the geometry of this type of walks is actually to understand what is the number of such walks. From a physics point of view, it will be what is the size of my space of configuration. So what is my free energy? What, how do I, my entropy, how do I compute this thing? So first question. is what is Cn, which I will define from now on as the cardinality of the number of walks of length n. Okay, for very small values, you can compute explicitly, just enumerate these things. But I want to draw your attention on one thing, which is that even if you have big computers, so with computers, And smart algorithm, actually, they are not trivial algorithms at all. Well, the best we can do, and this is works by the Australian teams. Well, you can, for instance, on Z2, you can exactly enumerate Cn up to C71. And you get basically 4.19 times 10 to the uh, 30. So this number grows very fast, and you are very, very soon blocked by the fact that, for instance, you can think about it, it's very hard to compute this recursively. It's very difficult to see how you are going to compute C72 using C71 simply because there are many walks of length 71 that cannot even be extended by one step. So it's a highly non-Markovian process. So on the hexagonal lattice, one can go a little bit farther because it's a smaller thing, so you can compute to 105, and you get this type of number. And you can, of course, do it on a... I mean, on the triangular lattice and so on, I could, uh, I could uh, give you many uh, uh, possibilities, like many examples. But the thing that is important is that they can compute the 105 first digit of this, I mean, first values of this sequence, Cn. If you tune it to any site, you know, recognizing uh, sec known sequences or like guessing uh, formulas, you don't get any formula. Nothing is popping out. Okay, this doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to be at least a closed formula for these values. Okay. Okay, there is one exception which I can mention, but it's a completely trivial one, is if you are on TD, then of course it's trivial to compute the number of safe holding work. For the first step, you have D plus one step, and then you cannot go back you have this step for every one of them, and you never have any risk of closing cycles. So you understand that the cycles are exactly what prevents you from computing well this type, of uh, this type of quantity. OK, so here, no exact formulas. At least, I mean, none that we know. but. Uh, probably non-overall. OK, so that can uh, look a little bit uh, um, bad news. 
But what you can do is you can relax a little bit what you want to do and say, OK, maybe I don't want to compute exactly Cn, but I want to compute the rate of growth. OK? So uh, second question. Compute the rate of growth. If you are, for instance, on Z2 or on ZD, you easily see that Cn is smaller than 2D times 2D minus 1 to the N minus 1. Right? For the first step, you have 2D choices. Then you have at most 2D minus 1 choices. But you also see easily that you are larger than D to the N. Simply because if you only go in the same direction, imagine you give yourself a basis, E1 to ED, but you always go in the direction of the edges, the oriented edges, E1, E2, up to ED. You never go back. If you never go back, you are going to be self-avoiding automatically at, a, at every step. You have D choices. So you know that you grow exponentially fast. And the natural question is, well, what is the rate of growth, if any? And that is one of the first results on self avoiding work. It's a very small and easy result. But I, I want to illustrate the fact that it's actually a deep proof in the sense that it was reused in many other instances. So it's due to Hammersley. And it's 54, so you see it's really, it didn't wait long. Is that for any lattice L, the limit when n tends to infinity of Cn to the power 1 over n, where it exists, it's a certain constant. And this constant is between 1 and degree of L minus 1. Here I really want to highlight the fact that the non-trivial fact here is the existence of this limit. Okay, so existence of this limit. Okay. So let's prove that. You are going to see it's one line. So proof. If you take a walk of length n plus k and you cut it after n steps, so you cut it after n steps, well, the first part of the walk is a self avoiding walk of length n, and the second part is a translate of a self avoiding walk of length k. So that immediately tells you that Cn plus k is smaller or equal to Cn times Ck. Right? This, so for any n and k larger or equal to 0, this plus the fact that Cn is smaller than d times d minus 1 to the n minus 1, where d is the degree. These two things combined give you, by uh, fekete subadditivity, lemma, where it gives you automatically that Cn to the 1 over n converges to the infimum of the CK to the 1 over K. And that's the end of the proof. So here you see that we actually prove something else, which is that furthermore, CN is larger than mu C to the N for every N larger or equal to 1, uh, to 0. OK? 
So very simple proof, but it's going to be very useful for us. OK. If you have any question, you stop me. I mean, for now, it's a little bit simple, but uh, it's going to get a little bit less simple later on. So, Yes. Do you have a convergence trait? Like a, a do, convergence, you uh, do we have a convergence uh, rate? Right. We are going to get to that. We are actually going to get to that. I mean, one of the beautiful things about uh, Sephardine work is that it's a very elementary model. So I would try to keep it elementary. But um, if I don't manage, you just stop me. So examples. So mu c of td is d. That's simple. For the people who are completely bored, you can try to prove this thing. And I will come back to this later. We will see that mu c of the hexagonal lattice is equal to square root of 2 plus square root of 2. So C lecture 2. But unfortunately, except these three cases, well, we don't have other examples, basically, basically of, uh, oh, oh, you can put mu c of z, but I'm, <laughs> okay. well, it's, no, it's the first thing, sorry. Um, we don't have other examples, basically. So if you look at mu c of, z2, for instance, you can approximate it. You can use the numerics. For instance, if you want an upper bound on mu c, you can take c71 to the power 1 over 71. It gives you a rigorous upper bound on mu c for z2. And you end up with things that look like 2, 7, I mean 63, 81. 5, 8, 5, etc. So it's indeed smaller than 3 and larger than 2, which was what we had here. And it's a certain number. All these digits are. are Sorry? We, we know all these digits for this? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I didn't just put them like that. Let's <laughs> see if somebody sees that. I'm no, right. you, you were saying it's the, uh, you, you have an upper bound. So I yeah, so, sure. okay. So what is known. Um, the rigorous bound is maybe five digits or something like that. But uh, this is indeed uh, numerics for the maybe these guys or something like that. I could check, but indeed, you are right. Yeah, that, that's, uh, OK, so this is uh, approximate. And I'm not going to give you a Z3 and Z4, but you also have estimate, of course, for them. So the bad news about it is that even with this simplified question, well, we still don't really have uh, exact formula. Okay, so that was for self holding walks. Now, what ends up, I mean, what do we get if we look at self holding bridges or self holding polygons? So, proposition 1.2 is going to be to bound these other guys. So here, just to simplify, but it will, let's think of ZD. But actually, uh, any graph embedded in RD would work. But it's uh, no need to make something complicated. Then uh, for every n, we have the following. So we have that BN, which is going to be from now on the number of cephalodic bridges of length n, well, bn will be smaller or equal to mu c to the n. And pn, which will be by definition the number of cephalodic polygons, will be smaller or equal to d minus 1 mu c to the n. So we get the converse inequalities. OK, so let's prove that.
So let's look at the first object and let's observe that we have exactly the opposite property to this one. If I concatenate a bridge of length n, with a bridge of length k, I end up with a bridge of length n plus k. Okay? And observe here that it was important to make a strict uh, um, distinction between small I mean, the left and the right. So here there is no risk that these two guys intersect. And so that tells me that bn plus k is larger or equal to bn times bk. Right? If I start from a self-holding bridge of length n and a self-holding uh, bridge of length k, I create a self-holding bridge of length n plus k, and I do it in a one-to-one -one fashion. If I know n and k, it's one-to-one. -one. So that immediately tells me, by fekete, that the limit of bn to the 1 over n is equal to the supremum of the bk to the 1 over k. And this obviously is smaller than the infimum. I mean, it's smaller than mu c. Simply because bk is smaller than ck, and ck to the 1 over k is tending to mu c. OK? Here I didn't claim, and this is important, I didn't claim it was an equality here, right? As for now, it's an inequality. OK, let's look now at polygons. So here the observation is a little bit the same. It's epsilon more subtle, but not much. Imagine I give you a polygon of length n, and I give you another polygon of length k, well, I claim that there is exactly one translation. Um, actually, there may be one more than one, but at least there is one translation that allows me to put this guy just here, like that. OK? Now here, if I erase these two edges and replace it by these two edges like that, I end up with a self-holding polygon of length n plus k. OK? And if you think about it, so if I start from I give me a gamma and a gamma prime, and I defi define concatenate, which is a thing which is going to translate the second polygon to put it exactly in such a way that the right side of the orange one is just next to the left side of the green one, and then change, do the XOR for the edges around the square, I end up with a self avoiding polygon of size n plus k which I'm going to call concat gamma gamma prime. OK, the point here is that it's not a one-to-one -one map anymore. The reason is that in dimension two, it looks like a one-to-one -one map. There is maybe one way to uh, translate and to put them like that and then switch. But in higher dimension, it could be that the leftmost point, the leftmost edge, is not actually a line like that. It could be that the leftmost edge is like that, for instance, right? So actually, you also need maybe to rotate your polygon to make the leftmost edge really like that to be able then to just concatenate, I mean, to just change like that. So for every guy here, it's actually easy to, re to reconstruct what is this part because that's the only part that you can do going from there and cutting in such a way that this has length k. That's the only one if I put, because I could have here two edges and I could think that I maybe made the change here. 
But if, the, if it's here, notice that then this guy will not have length k anymore. So there is an only red place, but then once I have identified this green and this orange guys, I still have d minus 1 possible rotation of this guy to start with. So it's a d, d minus 1 to 1 map. So this is concat is d minus 1 to 1 map, uh, is, uh, d minus 1 to 1, thus pn times pk is smaller or equal to d minus 1 p n plus k. And now this, you notice that this implies that pn divided by d minus 1 is submultiplicative. So pn divided by d minus 1 converges and converges to the supremum, which is the guy we wanted. is also small or equal to mu c. Hence the second guy. Okay. We are starting slow, but that's uh, okay. Just one remark before we go, uh, we do the break. Sometimes you will see actually that uh, you don't, I mean, you, you do not look at polygons up to translation and reflection. I mean, reflection of the ordering, of course. Orientation and, uh, and, uh, and translation of the ordering. So then be careful, you don't get Pn smaller than constant time mu c. If you look at Pn dot, which is the guy which has, so it's really uh, polygons, I mean, rooted polygons. with an orientation, then you should really be careful to get pn dot smaller than 2n d minus 1 pn, uh, mu c to the n. You get that pn dot is smaller than 2n pn. Actually, it's equal to 2n pn, OK? This is important if one day you, you end up working on safe avoiding work not to be confused because it's very simple to prove theorems. If you start from pn dot smaller than the mu c to the n, the problem is that it's not what is true, okay? And actually it's even wrong, really wrong. The pn dot is going faster than, uh, than if you, okay. So that's just a remark to, <laughs> to prevent uh, further uh, disasters. And now, for people who got bored since it's a break, I can answer the, the exercise. How do you prove that uh, mu c of the ladder is 1 plus square root 5 over 2? Well, the simplest way of doing it is to notice that bn is actually very simple to compute for the ladder. Why? Because bn plus 1 is simply equal to bn plus bn minus 1. If you end up somewhere here at this height, whatever the way you ended up there, you have exactly, I mean, you want to say that you are going to have either this way or this way to extend. I just realized that maybe you need to define B and tilde. Uh, let's see. What am I doing? Because, okay, well, <laughs> something like that is true. <laughs> With B0 equal B1 equal 1. So you just recognize Fibonacci. I mean, maybe you need to define the B and tilde because I realized that if you end up like that, you have like two ways of extending. So that's, that's maybe not good. But, uh, you can easily check that. 
And then what you end up with is that in this case, you see that Cn is larger than Bn, clearly. And it's smaller. Well, it, is, it can be larger than Bn simply because you can go back, right? If you do something like that, you may come back for a certain number of steps. And on the other side, you may come back for a certain number of steps. So you need to reconstruct potentially this and this. But you have only n choices for each one of these guys. OK? So you get here n square bn. So if this guy is growing like 1 plus square root 5 over 2 to the n, cn is also growing like that. OK, so let's make a break, like a five minutes break. And then what we are going to do later on is, uh, I mean, when we come back, is to prove the first non-trivial result on, uh, on safe forwarding work, which is this Hammersley wedge bound. Just one thing here that I notice I wrote is that Pn here is actually tiny. The number of, safe, of polygons of length n is really tiny. It's not growing at all, right? So it's smaller than uh, maybe you just need to decide which translate you take. So like uh, P2n is maybe smaller. And I don't know why I write this type of thing because I know I'm going to fail, but something like maybe n minus 1 or something like that. I mean, don't judge me. But, uh, <laughs> but the important thing is that it doesn't grow like 1 plus square root 5 over 2 to the n. So it's not always true that the rate of growth of polygons is the same as the rate of growth of, yeah, I see that uh, as a good PhD student, you want to make me wrong, right? <laughs> I see, I, <laughs> you will manage, don't worry, there is no, <laughs> no problem with that. It's, it, it's the worst type of thing because it's counting the number of uh, pylones or the number of intervals between the pylones, maybe it's n. Anyway, I will be right with n. So. Uh, okay, so let's stop and uh, let's take five minutes and uh, we, we start uh, with the Hammersley wedge bound. Okay, so you see that you prove that Bn to the 1 over n converges. You prove that Cn to the 1 over n converges and Pn to the 1 over n converges. Cn converges kind of from above, Pn from B and Bn from below. But at this stage, we don't know whether they converge to the same thing or not. Right? So the goal of this section is to prove that actually, at least on ZD, they all converge to the same quantity. They all converge to the connective constant. That will be very useful because, indeed, somebody asks, well, what are the bounds you know on mu c? on a Cn. So you know that Cn is larger or equal to mu C to the n. And here you have Bn. Imagine I can relate Cn to Bn in an explicit way. Then I will actually get an upper bound here because at this stage, the only thing I know is that this is smaller or equal to mu C to the n e to the little o of n. But I absolutely have no idea what is this guy. So my goal in this section is to prove the following uh, theorem. So theorem, so it's 1.3. It's called hammersley wedge It dates back to 62. And it says the following. There exists a constant C, so on ZD. There exists a constant C such that Cn is smaller or equal to e to the c square root n times bn for every n larger or equal to 1. Actually, let's maybe put mu c to the n here. So you have an upper bound like that. And we will see in the course of the proof that we will actually relate Bn to Cn. Yeah, maybe let's put uh, Bn here. Okay, so in particular, you get that Bn 
bn is smaller or equal to, I mean cn, sorry, is smaller or equal to e to the c square root n times mu c to the n. This goes back to 62 and it's actually the best known, it was the best known result in dimension 2. Now before I go into the proof, let me tell you what is the predicted thing. So conjecture. is that Cn is behaving like n to the gamma minus 1 plus little o of 1 mu c to the n. So it's n to a certain power where gamma is equal to 43 over 32 if d equal 2 is equal to something 1.162 1 if d is equal to 3 and is equal to 1 if d is larger or equal to 4. So that means in dimension larger or equal to 4, the corrections are sub-polynomial. In fact, in dimension 5 and more, they will be constant. So mu c will be comparable to, uh, cn will be comparable to mu c to the n. In dimension three, uh, in dimension four, you have logarithmic correction. Let's not mention it. Well, I just mentioned it, but let's not go farther than that. Dimension three, you have some numerical thing. And dimension three, two, cn should be equal to n to the 11 over 32 mu c to the n. I mean, equal up to sub-polynomial corrections. Exercise, <laughs> prove it. Um, so this is a big conjecture, I would say, in, uh, on safer wedding work is to deduce this, I mean, to get this 11 over 32. And I will tell you a little bit more about that next week. Just uh, a remark. Here I will really prove it on Z2, but you could also do it on the hexagonal lattice. So Hammersley Welch works on H. And actually, same thing, you will get cn smaller than e to the c square root n mu c to the n. But the truth is also cn should be, so also cn should be like n to the 11 over 32 mu c to the n. But I really want to highlight something miraculous there, which is this is mu c of z d, I mean, yeah, of z d. So in particular on z2, it behaves like n to the 11 over 32 mu z2 to the n. Here it's mu c of the hexagonal lattice. So mu c of z2 is larger than 2. And mu c of the hexagonal lattice, it's still written there and it will be proved next week. It's smaller than 2. So the the number of safe holding work on the hexagonal lattice and on the square lattice is absolutely not the same. Like at exponential order, it has nothing to do with each other. Yet, the correcting term in both cases is n to the 11 over 32. That's a beautiful thing. So it's a universal statement. So this term is universal. And I will tell you a little bit more why next week. OK, so that was a discussion before the proof of the theorem. Now let's dive into the proof. So this type of connection between, uh, I mean, this, this type of universal results are exactly what we are aiming for when we do statistical physics. OK, so we are going to go in two steps. One step will be actually quite simple. The second one will be a little bit more subtle, and that will be the core of the proof. So the first step is to relate, to relate the safe avoiding walk to half space safe avoiding walks. So define, we say that uh, gamma is a half space safe avoiding walk if simply uh, gamma i uh, e1 is larger than 0 for every i larger or equal to 1. So it remains in the right half space. Okay? Let's call h safe forwarding walk 
n the set of has space self-forwarding walks of length n. And here I'm thinking uh, starting from 0. And let's define hn to be the cardinality of so the, number, the number of walks of length n, the of half space, half space walk of length n. OK, so the first lemma is saying that Cn is small or equal to the sum for k equals 0 to n of hk times hn plus 1 minus k. In particular, my goal would be to bound hk, not uh, Cn. So how do I prove that? So exactly like before, the observation is going to be quite simple, is that you can cut a self-forwarding walk in two half-space self-forwarding walks. So what you do is the following. Imagine you have your walk like that. Well, define R of gamma to be the supremum of the S such that, uh, let's call it big S, such that uh, gamma big S, um, big S uh, E1 is the max of the gamma S E1. So you take the farthest point on the right, there may be several ones. You take the last one, OK? And what you observe is that this is, and maybe I could have taken the, OK, let's take the mean. That's more logical. So you take the minimal, the minimal value. You have several things. Take the last one. And what do I see? This thing, by definition, is going to be a half space walk of length k, which is actually r of gamma, uh, which is uh, n minus r of gamma. And this one, the beginning, is almost a half space walk going in reverse, if you go in reverse direction, except that it can touch several times here, so you just need to add one edge. OK? So if you take a walk and you do this, cut, this cutting procedure, uh, sorry, let's go there. So if you do cut, which goes from self-forwarding walk of length n into the union for k equals 0 to n of and which consists in taking gamma and you cut you take uh, you end up with gamma 1 gamma 2 where gamma 1 gamma 1 is a walk from um, 0 to r of gamma in the reverse direction you just reverse the direction of this thing. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Gamma 1 is going to be the walk from R of gamma to n. And gamma 2 is going to be the walk from 0, uh, from R of gamma to 0 when adding one more step before. So gamma 1 is a green walk. Gamma 2 is I do one step and I go reverse for the second guy. 
then this is this is a, a true map, okay? And it's a one-to-one -one map. You can reconstruct automatically the original walk. If I give you gamma one, gamma two, you just remove one step to gamma two, and you reverse gamma two, you go from gamma two to gamma one, and you get the walk gamma. So that automatically gives you exactly the bound. So uh, the fact that cut is one to one gives the result. Agreed? OK, so now that was the easy part. Now let's prove proof of theorem 1.3. <coughs> Actually, maybe let me uh, state one more lemma. I mean, let's isolate one lemma. It's, uh, it's maybe cleaner like that. So lemma 1.5, and combining the two will give us a result. Lemma 1.5 is the following, is that Hn is smaller or equal to, uh, let's call it Pn times uh, Bn, where Pn is the cardinality of the set of n1 small or equal, small or equal of a, to nk such that n1 plus nk is small or equal to n. So what is that? Oh, let, let's, okay, let's me, sorry, let me write it like that. Define small pn like that when it's equal to n. And this is what is known as a partition of an integer. So it's a number of partition of an integer by, uh, uh, yeah? Any yeah, any k. And capital Pn would just be sum of Pk for k smaller or equal to n, okay? So what I'm saying is In order to get Bn from Hn, you need to put this entropic factor, which is basically the number of partition of an integer smaller or equal to n in integer n1 to nk in an increasing order, a decreasing order or increasing, whatever. That's uh, the same. OK? OK, so let's prove this lemma. And then we will see how we, we get proof. OK. So what we are going to do, we are going to create a map from the set of half-space half self-forwarding walk into the space of self-forwarding bridges. OK? So let's define unfold. which to gamma associate this unfold of gamma, which is obtained as follow. Z. Sorry. So what, what we are going to do, so now we are a half space walk. So we are going to take R of gamma, which is defined there. So you take the, well, okay, let's say it's not R of gamma anymore, but you take the last point, which is farthest on the right. And you just unfold this part of the walk, meaning you take the symmetry with respect to this line. Okay? That's the first step of my unfolding operation. Now you take the last farthest point on the right, you unfold the remaining there. And you keep doing that until you end up with a bridge. In finitely many steps, you are going to end up with a bridge. OK, that's my unfolding operation. OK, so that's a well-defined map. Is it clear for everybody, this definition? Sorry? 
So you defined, let's call it, uh, so imagine this was R minus of gamma. It was uh, uh, the point which was the close, I mean, the, the most on the, the last point most on the left. Here you define R plus of gamma to be exactly the same, but with the max. OK? And what you do, so this is R plus of gamma, you do the symmetric of what is after this. Do the symmetric, it's well defined. Now you have a new walk, gamma 1. When you repeat the operation, you take R plus of gamma 1, you unfold what is after, etc. And in a finite number of steps, you will end up with a bridge. You stop at this stage. And what is going to be important for us, the important thing for us, is that unfold is at most, I mean, is capital PN to 1. Why is it true? If I give you a bridge, how many guys, how many half space walk could be associated to this bridge? Well, in order to be able to reconstruct the walk, what do I need to know? I need to know, well, where I unfold it. So I need to know these values here. Right? But these values, n1, n2, n3, n4, they have the specific property that they are decreasing. Why? Because n3 is basically this distance, which is definitely smaller than this one. n4, n2 is going to be this distance, which must be smaller than this one, etc., etc. So in order to reconstruct, I need the places n1 smaller or equal to n2 smaller or equal etc to nk where I folded. I unfolded. But n1 plus n2 plus etc plus nk is exactly equal to the width of my bridge. which, of course, is smaller or equal to n. Therefore, the number of possible pre-images is bounded by capital PN. The fact that I constructed this capital PN to one map immediately tells me that HN is smaller than PN times BN. Let us conclude the proof now. Yes. Cannot you get uh, the same inequality with little p instead of a big p if uh, instead of taking the position of the lines, you pick the, the instance, the times at which you reach? The problem of the time, it's a very good question. The problem if you take the time is that this is not decreasing anymore. You see, the width is decreasing, but you could imagine pick a walk which is going like that, and then does this like that, or let's say uh, does uh, and comes even just a distance one like that. What is the Hammersley wedge decomposition of that? You will unfold this whole part, right, and then you are done. One unfolding is sufficient to give you a bridge. But notice that the first, I mean, the first piece here is going to be huge compared to the second one. So you really want to do the width of the. Actually, it's rather good news. It's better to do the width because, for instance, we'll see in the third lecture that you can really prove that the width of your walk of length n is typically little o of n. It's not actually going ballistically. So it's actually a better bound. OK, so proof. But this is typically this type of things trying to modulate around, uh, around the proof that I'm presenting. I, I, I mean, I highly recommend that you try, because you are going to see, in fact, 
how much we are working on a thin line when you work with, uh, with, uh, with uh, self-forwarding work. In the sense that most of the proof, if you try to modify them a little bit, you break down completely. For instance, this argument seems wasteful on so many aspects. Like it really looks like you are doing something stupid. Like you could do much, much better than that. It took 50 years to get better than that. So it's, uh, and, and it's not like you get super good, <laughs> you are going to see. OK, anyway, let's uh, combine the thing. So how do you prove the theorem? Well, so you know that Cn is small or equal to sum k equals 0 to n hk h n plus 1 minus k. This is lemma 1.4. And by lemma, 1.5, you end up with sum k equals 0 to n of capital PK, capital P n plus 1 minus k. And you get Bn times B, I mean Bk times B n plus 1 minus k, but this is smaller than Bn plus 1, right? So this whole thing here, in fact, well, you could put, B, let's put Bn plus 1 because I don't want to bother with it, but. Of course, you could end up with Bn, but let's put Bn plus 1. So here, OK? It's completely clear that Bn plus 1, okay, no, maybe, <laughs> sorry, I changed my mind, but uh, it's going to be, otherwise, it's good. that's exactly the type of things you think it's a good idea on spot, and then you realize uh, three pages later than it makes your thing, your life uh, way worse. So let's put it like that. OK, clearly, Bn plus 1 is smaller than dBn. No, not clearly. Maybe I would stay with Bn plus 1. So <laughs> because, uh, I mean, if you remove one step, you don't end up with a. OK, we will see how I, I pay this later. Um, so what remains? Well, the only thing you remain to prove is that one can use a result which goes back, back a long time, Hardy and Ramanujan, which proves that Pn is smaller than E to the, uh, so let me, so it's two, I mean, it's a pi square root of 2n over 3, something like that. It's 3n over 2, 2n over 3. We are going to see that in a minute anyway. Yeah, 2 n over 3. So you can just use this plus little o of uh, square root n. So the estimate is actually quite sharp, the hardy ramanujan estimate. We are just going to use that roughly Pn is bounded by e to the pi square root of 2 n over 3. OK? So e to the square root n. If you plug this here, you end up with a bound in e to the square root n. Just because you maybe didn't all saw this bound, and it's a kind of uh, simple bound to get, let me, I mean, not the sharpest one, of course, but let, let me give you a proof of this pn bounded by e to the pi square root 2n over 3. It has nothing to do with self forwarding work, but I can't resist. So it starts from the following observation. If you take um, f of x, which is a generating function of the partitions of integers, you end up, maybe it's with strict that you want to do, but uh, no, no, it's a smaller way equal. So it's product for n equal 1 to infinity of 1 over 1 minus x to the n. This, I leave it to you as an exercise for people who never saw that. This is a generating function of this. <coughs> so that tells you automatically, and notice also that log of f of x, which is a sum for n equal 1 to infinity of log of 1 over 1 minus x to the n, this, if you expand, this is sum for n equal 1 to infinity k equal 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the n uh, k. 
am I doing something wrong? Divided by k, otherwise it's not going to. Uh, okay. Just I just expanded this guy. Then if you exchange the n and the k, you end up with x to the k over k, one minus x to the k, because it becomes just a, a geometric sum of x to the k. Right? OK. So let's go back there. Pn. Well, Pn clearly for any x smaller than 1. Notice that, by the, by the way, this immediately tells you that Pn is growing sub-exponentially fast, right? Because the radius of convergence of this is clearly 1. So for instance, if you would just like to prove that there are not exponentially many more cephoding walks and bridges, this would already uh, be sufficient. Here we are going to get something more refined. So Pn times x to the n is clearly smaller than exponential of log of f of x. It's smaller than f of x, so it's exponential of log of f of x. So it's exponential of some k equal 1 to infinity of x to the k over k. 1 minus x to the k. And here I'm going to put minus n log of x. I'm going to pn times x to the n is smaller than f of x. So this gives me immediately, immediately that. And then the only observation you need to do is you want to optimize on x this bound. So in order to see that uh, what, what is the best guy, what you do is x to the k over 1 minus x to the k. This is clearly bounded by, uh, so, OK, how will I write it? I'm going to write it like that. 1 minus x to the k over 1 minus x is larger than k x to the k minus 1. And the other guy is uh, 0 minus log. 1 over x over 1 minus x is smaller than 1 over x. OK, so these are the two things that you can get from the, um, from the I don't know how you say in English, like uh, inegality des accroissements fini. That will be the French touch uh, to, uh, to this talk. OK, so when you plug in these two things in this thing, what you end up with is that Pn is smaller or equal to exponential. So the first term, you are going to get a sum of the 1 over k uh, squared. So you are going to get pi squared x over 6, 1 minus x. And the second term, when you plug this thing, you end up with n 1 minus x over x. Why is it good to do it like that? Because you see that here there is a competition, x over 1 over x and 1 over this number here. So you have a lambda and a 1 over lambda. You want to get the best lambda possible here. It's going to be the lambda for which this term is equal to this one, which is roughly x equal 1 minus 1 over n. When you plug it here, you end up with the right result. So you optimize. So here, picking x such that pi square x over 6, 1 minus x equal n times 1 minus x over x gives actually that pn exponential of square root 2n over 3, a pi, and there is a 1 plus theta over 1 here. So if you want to do better than that, you can, of course, go to Ramanujan and Hardy or so on, but this will be, anyway, completely useless for us. But um, it's kind of funny that you can get this e to the square root n so easily, in some sense. And the proof of the simple proof of these facts are actually not so uh, old. It's, I mean, it's a very simple proof, but it took some time. OK. Yes. We did use a power series, but uh, we have a Cauchy product right here. And we also get one right here. Uh, couldn't we use uh, some Cauchy I'm going to get exactly to that. I'm going to get to, you are saying that this relation seems to be suggesting inequalities 
in terms of the generating functions. And they are, and we are going to use that. That's a very good point. Yeah. OK. Um, but before that, just this was for Bn. So you relate. So now we know that there are not fewer, much fewer Bn, I mean, bridges than, uh, than uh, walks. Let's see what we can get for Pn. So where was I? I guess maybe I'm going to erase there. So you see, it's full of small uh, like arguments, which are kind of uh, cute. It's, uh, I mean, I like it at least. Um, so proposition, I think it's maybe 1.6, is uh, Pn dot, I'm, uh, I mean, um, so for every n, If I look at P2n dot, so remember that the guy is where it's rooted and it's going in one direction. Then this is larger or equal, and maybe we should take D larger or equal to T. It's larger or equal to Bn squared divided by N. I mean, there is a constant C, or let's say K, and N to the D plus 2. So since we know we don't have in exponentially fewer bn and bridges than uh, walks, we also get the same for polygons. And the argument is not completely, I mean, if you try to find one yourself, it takes a little bit of time. I mean, here I'm kind of giving you the result all the time, so it's, uh, but try to, well, you can't, but try to ask somebody to do it. <laughs> now you saw the proof, so it's uh, too easy for you, but try to ask a friend to prove these things, you will see it's not, um, not so simple. So here, the idea to construct it is, uh, so here we feel like we should take two bridges and do something with it. So define Bn of x to be the, I mean the number of bridges, well, the cardinality of uh, self-avoiding bridged n x, which these are the bridges ending at x, OK? I'm going to take two bridges ending at x, and I'm going to modify them in such a way that I can create a polygon out of it. So imagine this is your bridge. OK? And the idea is going to be the following. You have a vector, which is the vector, I mean, you have a direction like that. Pick your translate, pick the translate in such a way that you are the last time to intersect this translate. So you, inter you never cross it, and maybe you touch it several times like that but you take the last point, OK? This we did several times for other directions. I'm not going to redefine correctly this thing. But here now I have two walks. I have this walk here, and I have the rest of the walk, OK? And notice that these walks are such that this is not going left of that, and this is not going right of, well, <laughs> bad chance. Uh, not left of that, not right of that. So observe here that if I pick this walk and I put it here, I end up with a walk from there to there. So I can translate. I'm just checking that I'm not doing something stupid. No, that seems to be OK. These red guys, if I put it here, I end up here from a walk with a walk from there to there, OK? Now imagine I took two bridges and I did twice this. What I'm going to end up with is I'm going to end up, if I take another bridge, I'm going to be able to construct exactly a walk from there to there above it. I just make the same construction, reverse, and put it on top. So out of two bridges ended at x, I can build by cutting there, translating, 
doing the same for the other one and reversing, I create a polygon. Voila. You see, once you have the construction, it's simple. And here, so let's uh, call it, uh, uh, let's say, glue. So self-forwarding bridges and x times self-forwarding bridges and x into self-forwarding polygon 2n, which, well, OK, maybe I, I don't define, a, uh, I, I draw you the thing. And here, the good point is, what do I need to reconstruct? How many image, I mean, it's a, how many to one map? Well, in order to reconstruct, I need to know for each one of the two bridges where I cut. So I need to know the index here. This is a certain gamma j. I need to know j here. I mean, maybe there are smarter ways of reconstructing, but definitely if I know j, and for the second one, I know j prime, then I can reconstruct my, uh, my works. So this is, so glue is at most n square to 1. And notice you could, yeah, Hop là. No, maybe the, OK, so it's at most n squared to 1. There is, I mean, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because here you see you could touch again, which there may be self-touchings. You should be a little bit careful with that. What you can do is just add one edge to be certain it doesn't intersect. But I mean, now at this stage, I'm going to start to be a little bit more. Uh, um, OK, so what does it give me? It gives me that Pn dot is larger we call. Actually, what you can see is that for every x, you get here guys that are really of different type. So you can even sum over x, the bn x squared over n squared. This is actually a lower bound for pn dot. Uh, two n dot? Sorry? Two n dot? Uh, two n dot, sorry, two n dot, exactly, yeah. And here, if you use Cauchy-Schwartz, you end up actually with sum over x of bn of x squared. So this thing squared is smaller than this thing times the number of possible possibilities for x. Well, x has n choices that way, and at most 2n plus 1 choices the other way, in every one of the other direction. So here you are going to get n times 2n plus 1 to the d minus 1. And overall, this is bn squared at the top. That's just the definition. And here you get constant times n to the d plus 2. OK? This is going to be actually crucial for us uh, next time. Because it also tells you that if bn is close to mu c to the n, so is pn. OK, so let's finish these lectures by mentioning a little bit. I mean, you see here we have a natural law on self-forwarding work of length n. From a statistical point of view, there is something a little bit disappointing with that, which is usually you don't really like, you want to take n to infinity. So you would like to have an infinite volume, an infinite, a law on infinite works. And this we are going to see is quite difficult. Actually, we do not know how to do it. But we know how to do it for bridges. And I want to explain to you that. So infinite self-forwarding bridge and Kesten relation. OK. So here we are. So as I said, the goal here is to construct an infinite self-forwarding uh, walk. And in order to do that, we are going to study a little bit the generating functions. So now I'm going back to, uh, to your idea. So define j of x to be the sum for n equals 0 to infinity 
of cn x to the n and define b of x to be sum for n equals 0 to infinity of bn x of n. OK? So it's a generating function for walks and for bridges. I mean, self holding walks and self holding bridges. And the main proposition, what will be important for us, is to prove the following. G and B have radius of convergence xc, which is by definition 1 over mu c. So that is actually uh, completely straightforward. Furthermore, limit when x tends to xc of g of x is equal to the limit when x tends to xc of b of x. It's equal to plus infinity. So our walks blow up. I mean, the gen generating function of our walks blow up. So that, I mean, you may uh, wonder what is non-trivial there. Because if you think about it, yeah, like that. So proof, well, clearly the first claim is, is uh, obvious. The rate of convergence is clearly 1 over mu c, right? Notice it's clear now that we know that Bn is uh, the rate of growth of Bn is the same as Cn, OK? But uh, Hammersley-Welsh implies rate of convergence equal to x. So that uh, radius of convergence. Yeah. Now the limit of g of x, uh, of j of x, sorry, well, that is not difficult as well, because g of x is the sum of cn x to the n, but cn is larger than mu c to the n. So this whole thing is larger than sum n equals 0 to infinity of x over xc to the n. So it's larger than this. So as soon as x tends to xc, you get infinity. OK? So what is going to be non-trivial is actually the b of x, because the b of x is smaller or equal to mu c to the n. So there, it's absolutely unclear that you get uh, what I claimed. Yet, it's not that difficult. Because if you look at this relation here, what does it give me in terms of generating function? Well, it gives me, so uh, this was lemma 1.4 gives that g of x is smaller or equal to 1 over x h of x squared, where h of x is the sum hn x to the n. Right? It's indeed a Cauchy uh, product, so you end up with this inequality. In particular, if j, j, goes, to, uh, j goes to infinity, then so does h. Now the question is, can we get from h to b? Well, this, if you think about it, the decomposition here was giving us a little bit more. So define, now define b n of x, or b t of x, to be the sum for n equals 0 to infinity of b uh, of b n t x to the n, where this is the number of bridges of length n and width t. Okay, if you restrict on bridges of width t like that, what did uh, 
what did we get from, uh, from the Hammersley Welsh argument? From the second lemma? Well, from the second lemma, we got that edge of x was smaller or equal to the sum for k equals 0 to infinity of the product for n1 smaller or equal to n2 smaller or equal, etc., to nk of b, or let's call it, yeah, b n1 and i of x. Right? That's exactly what we were getting for the, I mean, from the Hammersley wedge. If you rewrite them in terms of the generating function, that was the claim. But this is just the product for k equal 0 to infinity of 1 plus bk of x. Which itself is smaller just by than exponential of sum, maybe it's, maybe it's 1 here, sorry, sum of bk of x for k larger or equal to 1, and this is b of x minus 1. So what did I just prove? I proved that edge of x it is self-bounded So edge of x is bounded by exponential of bx minus 1. So from all of, so it's actually, this is more than just Hammersley Welsh. You cannot deduce it just from the result. You can deduce it from the proof. But that tells you that if jx tends to infinitely, so does edge of x, and therefore, b of x. And that's the end of the proof. But notice, for instance, that it gives you something absolutely non-trivial from the hammersley welsh part, which is, it tells you, so uh, corollary, and this is uh, 1.8, for infinitely many n, bn is larger or equal to mu c to the n divided by n. And maybe here I should put n well, 1 plus epsilon. The sum of the bn mu c to the minus n is infinite. That's, uh, if you try to prove it directly, it's not something... Uh, Straightforward, and I'm almost done. So from these observations, I want to construct for you an infinite self-avoiding bridge in the following fashion. There is a second corollary. Maybe here, just write it like that. I mean, this is a little bit... Uh, So here is the last corollary of today and of this lecture. So define an irreducible bridge to be a self avoiding bridge which cannot be cut into two self avoiding bridges. So what does it mean? which cannot be cut let me give you two examples this is not a safe avoiding bridge simply an uh, irreducible bridge because it can be cut there and I get a safe I mean two safe avoiding bridges this guy for instance, that's the simplest example, but of course you don't need to do things that are that uh, crazy. But this one is an irreducible bridge because there is no point where you can cut it in such a way that before and after you are bridges. 
Okay? So an irreducible bridge, another way of putting it, is it's a bridge which crosses every line in between at least twice. OK, so that's an irreducible bridge. Now defined b irreducible of x to simply be the sum over gamma irreducible bridge of x to the gamma. This is the length. OK? The generating function for irreducible bridges. So corollary 1.8, 1.9 is giving me the following. It's saying b of x is equal to 1 over 1 minus b irreducible of x, in particular, b irreducible of xc is equal to 1. So let me prove that and let me tell you what we do with it. It's really going to take three minutes. I'm uh, stealing three minutes of your time. How do you prove that? Well, every bridge has a unique decomposition. Really think of these guys are your prime numbers, right? Any bridge has a unique decomposition into irreducible bridges. So that means that b of x is the sum for k equals 0 to infinity of b irreducible of x to the k, simply because this is the generating function for the bridges which have exactly a decomposition into exactly k irreducible bridges. But this is just 1 divided by 1 minus uh, b irreducible of x. Now, since this guy is converging for every x smaller than xc, that means this guy must be smaller than 1 for every x smaller than xc. So b of x, let me finish here. So b of x smaller than infinity for every x smaller than xc implies uh, smaller than 1 for every x smaller than xc. OK? But also, b of x tending to plus infinity as x tends to xc that does imply that this guy is increasing to 1. So by the monotone convergence theorem, it tells you that b irreducible of xc equal 1. So that's monotone convergence. OK? Why is this good? It's very good because, you see, when you see a generating function, I mean, of something equal 1 as a probabilist, you should feel like joy. Because that means this is just your normalization for a probability measure. So this thing equal 1 for x equal xc means that there is a very natural probability measure on irreducible bridges, which is just, say, define p irreducible of gamma to simply be xc to the gamma. Just that. This is a probability measure. Is a probability measure on irreducible bridges. The sum over every configuration, every possible element in my uh, probability space, gives me 1. But once you have a probability measure like that, what you can do is you can take independent copies of this probability measure and concatenate them. Right? So now, imagine you take, so now, pick gamma 1 
gamma 2, etc. An infinite sequence of id. Maybe I'm going to write it with capital gamma. So these are of id random variables with low p irreducible and just define gamma to be the concatenation concatenation of gamma 1, gamma 2, etc. So you take an ID sequence of your irreducible bridges, you concatenate them, gives you an infinite bridge. And this is actually a very nice object. So that's what we will call, so this will be an infinite self-avoiding bridge measure on, so it's a, it's a probability measure on infinite self-avoiding bridges. Just to, 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 to illustrate the fact that there is something magical there and that is that it's a completely open question to define the natural infinite volume measure I mean, an uh, probability measure on infinite self-avoiding books. So, question, uh, define a natural measure on infinite self-avoiding walks. This is a question, and we will see that uh, at least maybe there is a way, but, but it's really, uh, it looks very complicated. Well, thank you very much for uh, your attention. <laughs>